Good morning. Let's stand as we get ready to sing a few songs together. And I, um, I would imagine it's been a long time since you did this this morning. Woke up this morning. So, so let's sing about it. I woke up this morning with my mom. supposed to have joy this morning, right? Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is great.
Worship the Lord with gladness. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before the Lord with joyful song. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before the Lord with joyful song. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Falkowski. I'm the preaching minister here at South Hills, and it's so good to see all of you today. This is my wife, Annette. She's going to have an announcement in a second, but we are just so glad to see all of you today. If you are a guest here in the building with us or a guest online, we just want to say welcome. And I want to let you know that there's a couple of different ways to communicate with us. There is a card in the seats in front of you if you are a guest. Please fill that out. Come and see me in the back. We have a special gift for you. If you're online, uh, just send us an email at southhillschurchofchrist at gmail.com. Let us know that you were watching. We'd appreciate it. Also, there's prayer cards in the seats in front of you. Uh, go ahead and fill those out. If you have a praise or a prayer request, you can put them in the offering basket on the back table. And if you are at home, uh, please send emails to southhillspraise at gmail.com and let us know your request that way. Annette? I am Annette Falkowski, and uh, it's nice to see all of you and to be seen by everybody on the live stream. The Spirit has been moving among us, ladies. Uh, independently, several women have come to myself and uh, Diane and shared interest in various women's ministry activities, uh, ideas they have. So. We thought it's time to put together a couple of meetings and get together and plan some events, uh, Bible study and, and other events where we can bring friends and just fellowship and grow together. So we're having two meetings. One is listed there on the slide, Tuesday, February 9th at 7 p.m. The second meeting will be uh, Thursday, February 25th, uh, also at 7 p.m. Both meetings will be in person here at the, at the church, but also uh, via Zoom. And any ladies that need a ride, if you don't care to drive at night, there are several of us that are happy to pick you up and bring you to the meeting and take you home. So I'm really excited about what we're going to do with uh, women's ministry and what the Lord is going to do through us. So um, join us or send us your ideas, and let's do something beautiful for God together. Thank you. And uh, the meeting coming up on the 9th will be up here in uh, the upstairs here. Uh, next up, we kicked off the uh, bottles for change for the options clinic a couple weeks ago, and we had a video that we wanted to show, and we couldn't get it to work last week. So we have it this week, and this just shows you a little bit about options clinic and what this particular uh, fundraiser is for. I'm looking at a masterpiece I'm staring at a work of art I'm listening to a symphony In every beat of your tiny heart You used, used to be a choice to me But now I think you've chosen me 
Cause I see ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes, and I know this is meant to be. Oh, I don't believe in accidents, miracles, they don't just happen by chance. As long as my God holds the world in his hands, I know that there's no such thing as unplanned. So if you didn't grab a bottle the last couple weeks, they're uh, outside in the foyer. Please grab one of those and bring those back on the 7th. That's when those are due. Uh, appreciate that. And lastly, just another reminder about a keep this on your calendar. Uh, February 15th, President's Day Monday will be our day up at uh, Great Divide. And it sounds like starting next week, we're supposed to start getting snow. And so by then, it could be really, really good snow and weather. So hope to see you out there for skiing and snowboarding. Tom? It could be me. <laughs> All right, cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' Oh, 
in a couple songs before we partake of communion together. Surround us, Lord, and then nothing but the blood. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Good morning, I'm Don Emerson. I'll be presiding over the Lord's Supper. So usually uh, when I'm asked to do communion, I'll um, think about it for quite a, quite a while before I have to do it, and I'll get in the study Bible, and I'll go online and I'll look at new and different things and uh, uh, try and come up with a, uh, something worthy of, of communion. And uh, so this morning, I'll just tell you straight up, I decided to go with a couple of scriptures. But I've been thinking the last week, week and a half, about my Uncle Bob. And I thought I would talk about that a little bit before communion. So my uncle's 80, um, not in good health. I found him on the uh, floor of his apartment about a week and a half ago. Got him into the hospital suffering from pneumonia and with some further uh, medical tests determined that he has esophageal cancer, uh, very aggressive. And uh, 
So my uncle Bob, I'm, I'm his only living relative here in Helena. He never married, he never had children. Uh, worked for the state, had a great job, good pension, lived in a uh, basement apartment, confirmed bachelor, like pulling teeth to get him to come to Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and uh, do things with the family. And so, you know, dealing with Bob over the last week, week and a half, and trying to help him get his affairs in order, I, I realized that, uh, you know, I'd never really talked to him about uh, finding Christ and uh, becoming a Christian. And uh, I, I kind of thought about how he lived his life, and, and in my mind, you know, spiritually blank or void, it's, it's kind of a lonely way to, I think, grow up even as an adult and live. And uh, so <clears throat> as I think about communion and I think about talking to my Uncle Bob, uh, you know, I, I wished I was better at being more uh, evangelical and uh, bringing people uh, to Christianity and bringing people to Christ. And uh, the communion's, uh, the Lord's Supper is a perfect, perfect example of talking to somebody about Christ and the uh, the sacrifice that he made, the debt that he paid for us, for the world, so that we could be forgiven and uh, be redeemed, and the, uh, the gift of, uh, of life after death. And uh, those are things that I, I think about when I uh, think about my Uncle Bob and, and wanting to give him hope, and uh, things that I know I need to do a better job of when I'm talking to my adult children and uh, even my grandchildren as they're coming up. So with that, uh, we have the cup and the bread is the, uh, you peel back the first layer to get to the bread. And I will read from John chapter 6, 53 to 58. And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Please join me in prayer. Father, we give thanks for your son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice so that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and receive eternal salvation. Amen. The next reading's from Matthew 27, or chapter 26. Um, and so I didn't have a chance to blow this one up, so bear with me as I uh, read the small print here. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine, from now, from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Father, we again give thanks for your Son, for it is through Christ's crucifixion and the blood of Jesus that has become the ultimate symbol of the cleansing of our sins. Amen. followed by, by Ralph. Thank you. Thank you. 
Beloved of God, good morning. Once upon a time in a far, far away place, there was a husband and wife. Several years prior to this particular Sunday, the husband and wife had been baptized for their sins to be washed away, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and to be added to the church. Their lives were exemplary. This Sunday was no exception. They, much like us, just had celebrated the Lord's Supper. The contribution baskets were being passed. Remember the time when we could pass the emblems and pass the basket and serve one another? Maybe sometime later? The basket was, a, was just a few rows ahead of where they, the couple was sitting. They were at a time in their lives where they did not have a bank account nor a credit card. A voice said to the husband, empty your money clip. And, and the husband said, really? And the voice said, empty your money clip. And the husband said, are you sure? And the voice responded, empty your money clip. And so he emptied his money clip. The story goes that the husband and wife had come to give a gift and they received a far greater gift. The story goes that they never missed a meal except by choice. Once upon a time, there was a, husband, a father and a son also. That was a long time ago, Genesis 22. God told Abraham to go to a certain place and offer Isaac as a sacrifice to him. Never mind that it was three, day, three days travel away. So Abraham took his donkey and two others with him and Isaac to a special place. When Abraham recognized the place, he told the two to stay with the donkey. Abraham and Isaac walked, to the rest of the, walked the rest of the way. While walking, Isaac said to Abraham, Father, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham said, the Lord will provide. When Abraham and Isaac arrived at the place, Abraham built an altar, placed the wood on the altar, and then he bound Isaac and placed Isaac on the altar. Then he reached for the knife, and as he did, a voice said, Abraham, Abraham, do not injure the boy. And behold, a lamb caught in a thicket. Abraham released Isaac and offered, and offered the ram. Abraham came to offer a gift to God, and he was given his son. And there's another father and son story in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And we know how that went. Jesus was beaten, crucified, buried, but the best was yet to come. Resurrection, ascension, welcome back to heaven. Jesus came to gift, and he was given a gift. You and me, the body. Give thanks with me. Father, our words are inadequate. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, our translator, our comforter, our leader to all truth. This is such a special opportunity especially in remembering the many gifts you give us each day. Remembering the special people sitting around us. Remembering the promise, the promise that you would be, the, be with us 
even to the end of the world. Such gifts we cannot equal. What we have to give to you, we give. A planned gift or the emptying, emptying of the money clip. We are yours, most holy God. Receive our gifts, multiply them for your glory. In the name of Jesus. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is truly the wonderful gift giver. I almost took the next song out of the list this morning. I'm glad I didn't. The way things have gone. We're going to sing this song. Let's stand together. Short one, but we're going to have to work a little bit to get it out. But it'll be worth it. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory. Hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory. Hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory. Hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Well, good morning again. Uh, Don and Ralph, thank you so much for your words of encouragement and reminders today. Really appreciate that. Uh, we are continuing in our series called Beginnings, uh, working through the book of Acts currently. We've gone through some of Genesis, about two-thirds of Genesis and about two-thirds of Acts now as we've continued for a little over a year uh, on the beginnings of the church, the beginnings of humanity, the beginnings of the universe, and our place in both of those, our place in the universe and our place in the church, in the community, in the world that God has called us to serve in. And as we continue the book of Acts, we're going to talk about power today. It's an interesting topic. There are people with a lot of power in our world today. Satan has a lot of power in our world today. There are people who unfortunately use their power for their own selfish gain. There are people who misuse power or misunderstand the power that they've been given. But today we're going to look at one who has authentic power. One whose power is trustworthy. We know that it's just and used for the right reasons. One who is loving with regards to that power. Jesus Christ had that power. He, he left it behind to come here, but through amazing power, he was resurrected from the dead, as we talked about earlier. And so we're going to look at that power and look at the, how that power impacts us, those of us who follow Christ, those of us who are dedicated to living a life for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to come together and talk about your great words to us through the book of Acts. Thank you for the examples that we're going to see today. Some amazing things are going to happen. Some amazing power is going to be witnessed, and there will be revival. There will be people turning to you in dramatic ways. Lord, may we be encouraged to live a life for you that makes a difference. A life for you that is different than the world that's around us as we serve our community. Lord, I lift up Don's Uncle Bob. Lord, I, I pray as he goes through what I'm sure is a, a painful time and a just, just a, a difficult time in his life that you somehow would work miraculously in him, that you would give Don the words he needs as he talks to him and the courage he needs. Lord, we lift up Carol Focher as she's uh, in the hospital right now, Lord. I pray for healing for her that uh, she gets the care that she needs, uh, that she feels your presence, and that she knows that she's not alone. 
And I just pray for us as a community as we continue to navigate uh, COVID and uh, the world that we live in. May we be your light, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have to ask a question, and I'm curious what you would say. So what does a Christ follower look like because of the Holy Spirit? Or what does a Christ follower look like because they have the Holy Spirit within them? What do you see? What's different? What makes them look different in the world? What would you say? Joy, Joy yes. Somebody was on our Bible class earlier that John taught, and we really focused on joy, how that comes out. Sean and I were actually just, or I was joking with Sean, that we seem to take a lot of joy in Cody here in church often <laughs> because of his allegiance to Pittsburgh, and we give him a bad time. But that's fun. That's joyful. What other things? Right, Sean? You think it's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what else? What else do we see in a true Christ follower that has them stand apart from the rest of the world? Boldness. Boldness. Who said that? Oh, Michelle. Boldness. Yes. Peace. Peace. Ooh, I got that twice. Peace. Someone who walks around with peace in difficult situations. Outgoing. Outgoing. What's that, Ralph? Student of, Student of the Word. Just eats up Scripture. Yeah. There's a special look in their countenance. I may use that in about five slides, Darlene. Yeah. Servant. 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 What's that? Light. Light. Those are all positive qualities, right, that we would see in someone who is a true Christ follower. We're going to see a situation today where there are some people who are following Christ who aren't necessarily showing any of those characteristics, and it's kind of curious as we look into this. So we're in Acts chapter 19. We're going to go through about half of the, the passage, the chapter today, and we're going to see some interesting things. If you remember last week, we were introduced to a gentleman named Apollos. Apollos, who was very fervent in the spirit, very passionate, uh, knew uh, the word, knew the Old Testament, and could argue very well. But he was missing something, and Priscilla and Aquila helped him to kind of fill in some blanks, and then he went off to the area of Corinth to continue preaching about Jesus. And so that's where we pick up here in verse one, while Apollos was at Corinth, and remember Paul had just spent 18 months in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And, and that's probably not quite the translation of what they're saying uh, if they knew anything about the Old Testament, they would have an idea about the Holy Spirit and know what Holy Spirit is. Their, their comment is more of, we did not know that there was a new outpouring or a new manifestation or something new with the Holy Spirit. So they didn't quite have the whole picture, a little bit like Apollos. And so in these disciples, Apollos is not included, okay? So that's an important thing too. We know that he's in Corinth. Uh, although, you know, there's some similarities here. But that story of Apollos really sets us up for what's going on here. So I go back to my question, what does a Christ follower look like when they have the Holy Spirit? Paul could tell, Darlene, maybe countenance. You know, maybe, you know what was it? But Paul could tell that they were missing something, missing the Holy Spirit. You know, was it in their actions? Was it in the fact that they just didn't have the whole story as he was interacting with them? But notice, they are called disciples. They aren't disciples of John. Luke would have given us that specific. We're going to get a little more on that here in a second. They are disciples of Jesus, but they don't know about the Holy Spirit yet. And so Paul asks, okay, so what baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism. So John the Baptist, if you remember, he came. He was the forerunner. He was baptizing in the desert for a baptism of repentance, but his main goal was to what? Point people towards the one to come, Jesus, the one who was greater. And so Paul said, well, 
John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. And so here we have this, you know, somewhat of an introduction to Ephesus because Paul's going to spend a couple of years there. It's going to be a very important city. Uh, we're going to see some difficulty that the people of Ephesus are witnessing here in our passage. But this is a powerful city. And so to start out the conversation in Ephesus, to have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on these 12 men is going to be very, very important. The church in Ephesus will be pivotal to the spread of the gospel. And so we see this outpouring. It makes sense that it would be here. So these gentlemen, these 12, they have their own, if you will, Pentecost event. Their own receiving of the Holy Spirit. Paul sees that they're believers, but they were lacking something. And so, hearing this, they were baptized, Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And so the church in Ephesus is born. Isn't that cool to see the birth of something happening? That's the church in Ephesus. And so as we look at this, you know, and get back to my question, you know, are there things in my life? Am I living a full life in the Spirit? Can people tell there's something different in me when I walk around, when I go to 1889, when I'm out riding my mountain bike? Is there something about me that causes people to say, you're unique, you're different. I can see the Holy Spirit in you. But as often happens with Paul, the same old story. Paul's going to go to the synagogue. And he's going to try to persuade the people in the synagogue from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what he's done in every town that has had a synagogue. He goes to the Jewish population. They, are, they have familiarities. They know the Old Testament. They have things in common. It's a good place to start. And so verse 8 tells us he spoke boldly there for three months. That's usually doesn't make it quite that long. So, makes it for three months, are arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some of them become obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So we see something different this time. Usually Paul is pretty much run out of the synagogue because they're tired of listening to him. But here we actually have an attack on the way. The way meaning the church, if you will. The way meaning following Jesus Christ. And so Paul, he wants to protect the way. You know, the way, the story of Jesus, the salvation that comes through Jesus is very important to him. And so this Jewish community has been here for a long time, probably 300 years before this. It's one of the older Jewish communities. They, they're foundational in the city of Ephesus. And so they have these discussions, and as it says, they maligned the way, so Paul left them. Paul went to other places. He planted a seed there, three months of discussion, but he went on to someplace else. And so he enters the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this is an interesting thing if you look at it from history. So actually, Tyrannus, if that truly is his name, means tyrant. And so he goes to the hall of the tyrant. More than likely, if he is some sort of lecturer, his students have given him that nickname, the tyrant. Um, maybe as you went through school, you remember teachers that uh, you might have called the tyrant. But he just happens, he's probably a businessman, he sees an opportunity. Well, what happened is in these lecture halls in Athens and other places, Ephesus, so in the morning is when all the wealthy people, the schooled people would gather. So they'd gather at a lecture hall like this until about 10 or 11 when it started to get warm, then they'd go home and 
make sure that their servants and their slaves were doing their work. So they would hear all these ideas, and then for the rest of the day, it would be siesta time. But what happens is Tyrannus sees, and this is what historical documents tell us, that he's got an empty lecture hall. He's not making money from like 11 to 4. And so he works this deal with Paul and says, hey, Paul, I'll give you the lecture hall. It's not the best time of day, but it's all yours. Nobody's using it. So from 11 to 4 in the heat of the day, that's probably when the blue-collar workers would show up. So these people are making a decision to come into this hall instead of taking their siesta because they want to hear more about Jesus. And that lasts for two years as people come and they hear this. And then this last sentence tells us that while Paul was there, the church spread throughout all of Asia Minor, that area we call Turkey. And more than likely during this two-year time frame, seven big churches are established. Those churches are the ones that are going to come up in the book of Revelation in the first couple of chapters. The gospel continues to grow. And notice, it isn't just through one man, Paul, or Peter, or even Apollos. There are others who have taken up the mantle of being a missionary, an apostle, and going out and sharing about Jesus, and the church is thriving. And so now let's talk about power. We are going to see some crazy things. We've already witnessed something that I would call pretty crazy with Peter, if you remember. People were laying their sick on the side of the road, so if Peter walked by them, his shadow might touch them and heal them. But we're going to see something just as fascinating occurring here in verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. And so that word cured there is really important. So we know that Luke is a doctor by trade. Luke is writing the book of Acts. That particular word is only used by physicians to talk about someone being completely cured of something. So Luke is kind of putting his physician's hat on here and telling us that these were not just you know, oh, I felt good for a little while or something. I mean, these are immediate cures for illnesses and evil spirits leaving people. And also, this is not, oh, I just did some cooking. Let me take my apron off, give this to you. These are probably sweat rags as, you know, Paul is working as a tent maker. He would have a piece of leather or something around his head to keep the sweat from going on his work. And that, that's what these people are willing to take and God is through the Holy Spirit is using those pieces of fabric to heal people that is powerful I haven't seen anything like that in our day but the Holy Spirit can move in powerful amazing ways and if you think about it if these are just strips of leather with sweat all and dirt all over them God is taking something filthy and using it for the good. God has taken something filthy and used it for his good. That's who we are. That's who we're called to be. I'm sorry if I called you filthy at one time, but we all were before we found Jesus. And God redeems us, redeems that for his good, for his purposes. And so now we see where some power is misused or maybe some individuals are misinformed or misguided it's really fascinating i did not know this until i did some research but the jewish people there were actually exorcists among the ancient jews and they were very well known for their chants and incantations and the way that they would interact with spirits and so that gives us a little background for what we see here in verse 13 Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, 
but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran from the house naked and bleeding. So, I mean, notice what's going on here. You've got this group of exorcists, Jewish exorcists, who have seen these miraculous things happen, passing around clothing, and people are healed, and they're like, I want to take advantage of that. I see an opportunity here. I don't know anything about this Jesus. Oh, I see Paul. I've interacted a little bit about, with him, so I know a little bit about him. Let's give it a try. So they misuse the name of Jesus. They have no relationship with Jesus, and they try to remove demon or demons from an individual. And I love the demon's reply. And this should cause us to quake a little bit too. You know, I know Jesus. Satan and his demons know, and that word is know, Jesus. They know of him. They've been in his presence. They know the power that Jesus has. And I've, I've heard of Paul. Paul hasn't done miracles before this. Paul has been a miracle before this. But I know about Paul. And I don't know who you are. I mean, this should cause us to kind of step back a little bit. You know, do we invoke the name of Jesus or the Holy Spirit in the right way? Do we truly know the power? Do we truly know the person of Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit? And so this, whole, this evil spirit says, all right, let me teach you a bit of a lesson. One on seven takes them on. They leave naked and bleeding. Pretty scary situation but it's a display of power that should cause us concern because Satan is active. His demons are active in this world. There is spiritual warfare around us. What is he doing to distract us? What is he doing to mess with our lives? But just like with the filthy rags, we see God redeeming this situation. Verse 17, revival. Revival comes to Ephesus. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. I would be seized with fear if I was aware of that happening. And I love this. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. These guys had just misused the name of the Lord. They misused the name of Jesus. God's name will always be lifted up in its proper honor. Now, this doesn't mean that there was a mass conversion of these individuals. It simply says that they were seized with fear, and I'm sure that fear caused them to start asking some questions. Who should we serve? Verse 18 tells us that many of those who believe now came and openly confessed what they had done. Confession leads to revival. And a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And understand that these scrolls, so they're chants and curses and incantations. There was actually this phrase with regards to spiritual warfare, especially these types of sorcerers and things like that, that it was called Ephesian letters. That's how well known the city of Ephesus was for this type of spiritual warfare going on. And so they brought these together. These are Jews, these are Gentiles, bringing these scrolls together. This was big business. It says when they calculated the value of the scrolls, it was 50,000 drachmas. One drachma is a day's wages. 50,000 days wages. This massive revival of repentance and confession. And what happens is, you know, these types of curses, they, they work really well in secret. But once you throw them out into public, they lose their power. And not only are they throwing them out into the public square, they're getting rid of them, burning them. It's also interesting that in Ephesus, on the statue of Artemis, some of these very little curses and incantations are on that statue. 
These people are really taking a jump and a leap of faith. They are saying, we are leaving Artemis behind. We are leaving that type of religion behind. He is not a true God. He has no power. We are going to follow Jesus. That's a commitment. And so Luke gives us a breather. And there's a lot that just happened in these last 19 verses. A lot of power, a lot of confession, a lot of work of the Holy Spirit that's been occurring. And so Luke says, all right. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Luke does that about five different times so far, where he kind of gives us a lot of energy, and then, okay, let's take a break, and let's kind of take stock. What just happened? What have you witnessed? Let's ask some questions. Let's think through this. What have you, how have you come closer to God through this situation? But this time, it really serves as a pivot. This is really the end of Paul's missionary endeavors, if you will, although he's going to be a missionary the rest of his wife, his life. He's going to be a true evangelist. But he's going to start having more travels and trials and tribulations as he moves towards Rome and his death. And so this is a big point in history. But revival has occurred. What happened has, this dark weight has been lifted off of Ephesus. That's kind of how I envision it. If, if you have, I mean, the power of all of these scrolls and these incantations and these curses and like the, you know, the evil spirits that are around there have been like feasting and living in this setting. And now this group of people who have been their followers and have been speaking positively of them, just burn all these and give that up? Can you imagine this? this? It's been lifted off of people's shoulders. They no longer have that dark power over them, that magic that they've been calling upon. A weight has been lifted. And I think as we look towards 2021, how many of us were hoping in the first month that a tremendous weight would be lifted? Well, we've started the vaccines. We've had some of the regulations lifted. There's still a weight on us. But there is one more powerful than that weight. There is one that's more powerful that we can call on that will help us have joy and peace in the more difficult situations. And so, I think about Paul and I think about Ephesus and his prayers, Paul's prayers and his letters often come to mind. And so what does that power look like? I want to look at Ephesians 1 really quickly. And so in most of Paul's letters, he will have an opening prayer where he says, this is what I am praying for you constantly. This is my hope that will happen for you. And I give thanks for you. And so Paul, you can imagine, kind of a father, if you will, his, his child, the church in Ephesus, yes, there's some struggles there, but he wants to encourage them. He wants to lift them up. He's constantly praying for them. And here's what he says. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that you may know him better, that you may know God better, that the Spirit will work in you and you will call on the Spirit and use the Spirit because we have the Spirit within us and you will know God better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We have inherited as believers, we have inherited something amazing. Better than these crystal clear, beautiful mornings like today. Yes, that's a sign from God. Yes, that's God's creation. But we have inherited something so much better. It is a hope that gets us through all the difficulty. We live with Him. And His incomparably great power for us who believe. We just saw some of that power as we looked through Acts. He has that power. That's who we worship. 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Raising somebody from the dead? There is no power greater than overcoming death. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Appointed him to be head over everything for the church. That's us. That's our Savior. That's our brother. That's the Son of God. Always remember, you bear his name. A powerful name. You are a Christian, Christ in. A reflection of Christ who has the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You are a child of God. A child of God. I mean, think about that. You are loved. You are loved. And so, we, I, need to live that way. Unlike the disciples in this passage, may the fruit of the Spirit be visible in each of us every day. May we use the spiritual power that Paul references to comprehend who Jesus is. Because when we fully understand Jesus, we're going to make some changes in our lives. Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth 33 years or so, lived among us, was tempted like us, cried with his friends, Jesus wept, experienced the most brutal beating you could ever imagine had to carry a cross, then was put on the cross, died, but was raised again, and as Paul says, is now in heaven in a place of authority, one of true power. And so, I want to read this prayer over all of us today before we have our closing song. So would you bow with me? I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you those in the South Hills Church of Christ, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you, each of us, may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you, in order that we, may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's us, his holy people. And his incomparably great power for us who believe That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the South Hills Church of Christ and the body of Christ on earth which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Amen. I want to express to you that the Spirit has been at work today in ways you don't know. Let's stand as we sing this song. And before we sing, there's been two words that have been used today, joy and power. And this song here is all about lifting up the Lord and one another before him. Let's sing this. For the Lord, For the Lord is a righteous God.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, great Lord, most high, holy of all these. Lord, we are truly grateful for all you give us, Lord. There is many in our congregation in this world right now are suffering. Lord, we just ask that you please reach out, touch them, and, and comfort them and heal them. Lord, we ask that you take our anxieties away from us through this week and empower us to be good disciples, Lord, and that your will be done. And thank you very much for your son, his sacrifice. For without him, we wouldn't be able to have your grace as we have today, Lord. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.